Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us at the Canada Aviation and Space Museum and online via Zoom for the eighth annual Kenneth Molson Lecture Series. My name is Erin Gregory, and I'm the curator here at CASM, your MC and moderator for this event. Bonjour à tous et merci de votre présence au Musée de l'Aviation et de l'Espace du Canada et en ligne sur Zoom pour cet huitième événement annuel de la série de conférences Kenneth Molson. Je m'appelle Erin Gregory, je suis conservatrice ici au MEC. Uh, je serai votre animatrice et modératrice ce soir. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that Ingenium and its three museums, including the Canada Aviation and Space Museum, are situated on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe peoples. It is our privilege to work and learn as settlers on this land. Nous apprécions de pouvoir travailler et apprendre sur cette terre. This evening will follow a slightly different structure than we have in the past. Instead of three presentations followed by a Q&A with our speakers, the evening will start with a short presentation on the history of the Royal Canadian Air Force, followed by a fireside chat with our three incredible guests about their equally incredible careers. La structure de cette soirée sera légèrement différente que par la passée. The structure of this evening this night will be slightly different. The evening, instead of having three presentation and a question and answer with our speakers this evening will start with a short presentation on the story of the Royal Canadian Air Force followed by a fireside chat with our incredible guests about their equality and incredible careers. Bien sûr, yeah, it is important to also mention that we are offering interpretation in French and English as well as sign language interpretation. Our interpreters will do our Thank you, Aaron. Good to see a, a good crowd tonight. It looked beautiful out there, but I hear it's a, it's a little bit nippy. So thanks for coming in. Uh, je m'appelle Chris Kitson. Je suis le directeur général du Musée de la... My name is Chris Kitson. I am the director of the Canadian Aviation and Space Museum. I would like to take the opportunity to welcome you to this well-received well Kenneth Molson Lecture Series. And of course, at the moment, we will be also doing with them throughout the year. We're, we're grateful. We've long been grateful for the strong ties that we have uh, with the Royal Canadian Air Force. Uh, our collection, which began with three or four different collections, one of which was a Canadian military collection, stands as a testament to this long-standing tradition, and it runs right up until today. So very recently, actually, in November of 2023, we acquired our most recent acquisition, the uh, Davlin Buffalo CC-115, which now has a place of prominence in our hangar, and you can go over there and see it's beautiful, and it's right at the beginning of our tours that run through that particular space. Now, more than 60% of our collection is made up of RCF military um, uh, aircraft. So it, it's a significant part of what we do, and we're deeply grateful to the RCF for their longstanding tradition of sharing that collection with us and with the country. Through that collection, obviously, we're able to tell the stories about the individuals and about the technologies themselves that have helped shape our country. Our museum, in turn, has been steadfast in its dedication to the preservation of this invaluable collection. Through our exhibits, we aim not only to preserve that history, but also to educate and inspire our visitors, and in part through that legacy of the RCAF. So tonight's lecture, as I've noted, is one of several ways that we will be celebrating this year. Another is with our major upcoming permanent exhibition opening of the Cold War. Um, and so that will be opening on April 5th and I hope that uh, you'll all come back and uh, uh, enjoy that exhibition with us as well. So before I go, I would like to express um, our, our deep thanks and gratitude to the Ingenium Foundation and you'll be hearing from Amelia very soon um, from them and from the Kenneth L. M. Molson Foundation, both of which helped to make these events um, free and available to all of you. Their commitment to preserving and promoting our aviation heritage has made all of these types of public programs possible. 
I'd also like to say a special thanks to Robert Eldridge, the president of the Kenneth M. Molson Foundation, who could not be here with us today. He typically is. And I want to recognize how much we appreciate the support that he and the foundation have provided over the years for these lectures and for many other programs that we provide. They've also supported that Cold War exhibition that I was noting earlier. So very grateful to the support that we've gotten from both groups. Uh, I look forward to tonight's evening that they've helped us uh, promote and celebrate. So without further ado, let's continue with our program. I'll now invite uh, Amelia Puttifer to come up and speak on behalf of the Ingenium Foundation. Thank you, Aaron. Merci et bonsoir à tout le monde. D'abord, good merci. evening and welcome to all. Thank you very much for all having being here. It's always a pleasure to see the participation in this type of gathering. I'm very happy to see how many of you. hundred years of the Royal Canadian Air Force. Uh, for a century, the Royal Canadian Air Force has been an emblem of excellence, of bravery, of innovation in the aerospace industry. From uh, pioneering missions, breakthrough technologies, the RCF have consistently pushed boundaries of what's possible, inspiring generations of Canadians to reach for the stars. I try to kind of put a few puns in, so, you know, just... Watch out for them. The Ingenium Foundation is steadfast in its mission to make science available to all. Tonight's lecture series is not just a celebration of the Royal Canadians Air Force Centenary. Um, it's a testament to our commitment to ensuring that every Canadian has the opportunity to learn and, and to be inspired. Um, I would like to also express our deepest gratitude to the Kenneth Molson Foundation for their generous support Without their unwavering commitment, um, events like this uh, series would not be possible. Their dedication to preserving our aviation legacy ensures that the stories of our past continue to inspire and educate for years to come. As we look ahead to the next century of uh, aviation excellence, let us continue to inspire curiosity, to foster innovation, and to build a future where everyone has the opportunity to soar to new heights, all right, all right, all right. Okay. Merci à tous et je vous souhaite une très Thank you very much to all and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Amelia. Uh, no total visitors from that side of the uh, theater. Uh, okay, so I'm now going to go through uh, basically a very, very quick presentation, so bear with me, please. Um, the Royal Canadian Air Force is celebrating 100 years of service to the country called Canada in times of peace and war. It was not the first iteration of an Air Force here, but certainly the most lasting. This presentation will provide a very brief overview of the history of the RCAF, its contributions to the country, and indeed the world. I really have 10 minutes, so this is like 30 seconds a decade. Um, so what did the RCAF look like when it was established on April 1st, 1924, and what did it do? help if I can advance the slides. Um, at the time, it consisted of a permanent full-time active air force, a non-permanent active air force, which trained a few weeks a year, and a reserve force to be called upon in times of national emergencies. There were 62 officers in the permanent active air force, four in the non-permanent active air force, and 262 non-commissioned members. William Barker, one of the most decorated service people in the history of the Canadian Armed Forces and famed World War I ace, was put in charge for the first couple of months. Throughout the 1920s, the RCAF was focused mainly on civil government air operations, such as forestry and fishery patrols, aerial mapping, and participation in northern exploration, such as the Hudson Strait Exp Expedition in 1927-1928. With a few servicemen and a few airplanes, RCAF pilots came to be known as bush pilots in uniform, and the service itself was equated with the Vickers Vedette flying boat. Miss that one. All right, here we go. The 1930s was a complex time that began with a biting 20% reduction of the RCAF and its budget cut in half in the wake of the Great Depression and ended with the beginnings of war in Europe. 
By 1935, the economy improved and the growing tensions in Europe led to rearmament and a focus on military flying activities rather than civil ones. In 1938, the chief of the air staff became directly responsible to the Minister of National Defence, which officially made the RCAF equal in status to the Canadian Army and the Royal Canadian Navy. That year, the RCAF reorganized itself into Western and Eastern Air Commands. When war broke out in September 1939, the RCAF mustered 4,061 people and 270 aircraft. Only 19 of those aircraft could be reasonably considered modern at the time. What happened next was the beginning of a dramatic transformation in this service. At its peak, the RCAF was 215,000 strong, including 17,000 women serving in the women's division. There were 47 squadrons. They served in Fighter Command, Bomber Command, Coastal Command, and Transport Command, and in theaters of war from Europe to the Far East. On the home front, the transformation was equally dramatic. On December 17, 1939, Canada signed an agreement with the United Kingdom, Australia, and New Zealand, the basis of which was that Canada would be the site of a large training operation known as the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan, or BCATP. From February 1940 to 1944, over 130 aircrew from all over the Commonwealth and many European countries trained here as pilots, navigators, wireless operators, bomb aimers, gunners, and more. Over 150 training facilities were built across the country, and their construction and use transformed the communities nearby. My favorite stat is that the amount of concrete used in the construction of all of these sites could build a 20-foot highway from Ottawa to Vancouver. The aviation industry in the country owes much to this program as well, as over 10,000 aircraft were built here to support it. At the end of the Second World War, the RCAF was the fourth largest air force in the world, and its golden age was yet to come. Demobilization led to the reduction of personnel to about 12,000 by 1948. However, as the Cold War heated up, Canada found itself geographically sandwiched between ideologically opposed superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union. This war was very real, although it had a very different character, and air power was as central to defense as ever. Canada joined international organizations such as NATO for the protection of Europe, NORAD for the protection of North America, and the United Nations for the protection of the world. These commitments led to unprecedented peacetime growth in this service, and the RCAF was 50,000 strong by the end of the 1950s. Fighter squadrons served in France and West Germany, radar lines were built and operated across the country, and peacekeeping missions were executed in the Middle East and in Asia. The 1960s saw the RCAF introduce nuclear weapons with the Starfighter, the Voodoo, and Bomark missile to a great deal of controversy. The 1960s were also the beginning of a long period of financial restraint and the gradual reduction of Canada's military. Efforts to save money led to the unification of the, Cana of the Canadian Army, the Royal Canadian Navy, and the RCAF to form the Canadian Armed, Ser uh, Canadian Armed Forces, or the CAF. Unification meant that the air arms of the, Na of the Army, Navy, and Air Force were now the air element. The 1990s saw yet more dramatic changes and further cuts to military spending. The Air Force shrank from 20,000 strong to 13,500. Whole fleets were disposed of and bases were closed. But demand for air services was still high as Canadian maritime transport and fighter aircraft and personnel went into, the, went into combat for the first time in 40 years during the Persian Gulf War in 1990-1991. Later that decade, CF-18s and crews were in combat once more in Kosovo in support of NATO. UN missions in Africa and the Far East were also supported. More recently, the Air Force supported international counterterrorism operations in Iraq and Afghanistan and also served in Libya. But the Air Force doesn't just operate internationally. It also serves Canadians at home in many ways, including saving lives through search and rescue services, protecting borders and assets through maritime and sovereignty patrols, and is often called upon to assist in the event of natural disasters and other domestic crises. The Air Force assisted Canadians during the 1997 Red River Flood and the 1998 ice storm. It transported personnel, equipment, and vaccines during the COVID-19 crisis, and evacuated folks from towns and cities at risk from wildfires. As I said, this is but a brief overview of what our Air Force has accomplished in the last 100 years. We at the museum are privileged to share this proud history with Canadians through the collection, exhibitions, and programs like tonight's lecture. Which leads me to the moment we've all been waiting for, and thank you for indulging me. Allow me to introduce our three wonderful guests who have graciously agreed to share their personal experiences of serving with the RCAF. 
So I'd like to bring up uh, Lieutenant General Lise Bourgon, who is the Deputy Commander of Military Personnel Command, RCAF Command Chief Warrant Officer John Hall, and last but not least, Captain Edward Soy, currently serving as Snowboard 10 in from Moose Jaw tonight. Hello. All right. Okay. So, first question is a tough one. Obviously, you guys will be experts in all of these topics because they're yours. Um, so, I'll start uh, with Lee's and we'll just go across. Uh, this question is kind of for everybody. Um, how did you come to join the military and what led you to the Air Force specifically? Thanks, Erin. Hey, bonsoir tout le monde. C'est un plaisir pour moi d'être ici avec vous. Comme de raison, à la présentation, je vais la faire en anglais. Je pense que c'est plus facile, mais... Mm -hmm. uh, so pardon. I'll turn to the presentation in English. I think it will be easy, but if in, during the question period, if there's any question in uh, French, I will be happy to respond in your language of choice. And uh, to get a degree. Uh, as I showed up at the recruiting center, they asked, what, what do you want to do? And I'm like, I want a degree. And they're like, no, 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 you got to pick an occupation. And I'm like, I don't know, what do you have? And uh, it was pretty interesting because at the time, it was exactly when they were opening all the occupation for women. So they, they gave me the list and, uh, you know, first choice was logistics, second choice was MP, and then the guy, uh, because it was a guy, said, uh, what about a pilot? And I'm like, Okay, well, I'm just doing it for five years because then I'm going to quit and go do something else. So that's, uh, that's how they got me into the military uh, as an Air Force, and uh, I fell in love uh, the day I went to sea flying the Sea King, and uh, it's been a lot of years, something like 37 years, and uh, I, almost every day I love what I'm doing, so it was a good choice. And you have 2,200 hours on Sea King, so that's... She's pretty, she's pretty awesome. Uh, so, John, will you share your story? Uh, yeah, thanks, Aaron. So, um, I was a less than stellar student. Uh, so, post-secondary wasn't really in my future. Uh, and I wanted to do something. And I'd been an air cadet for five years, and it, it was very interesting to me. Uh, so, I went to the recruiting center in October of 1986. And they said, what are your occupation choices? And I said... Uh, aero engine tech, airframe tech, or poet air. And poet is performance oriented electronics technician. Uh, so they called me in January of 1987 with a job offer and they said, poet land. And I'm like, no, I, I wanted air. And they said, all we've got is land. And I, I said, okay, so what about air? And they said, just ask in Cornwallis. You can change when you get to Cornwallis. So uh, not knowing it was a a bit of a line that I'd been fed. I, I took it hook, line, and sinker. I ended up in Cornwallis in, in February of 1987 as an Army uh, poet recruit. Uh, ended up a year and a bit later as an Army rad tech and then came to the Air Force in 1995 when they reorganized the trades. Uh, so it was purely because I, I wanted to do something and post-secondary education was not in my future and I, I was just interested with doing something. And it, at the time, it was, it was a job and it turned into a career. So uh, I actually tried to join the, the regular force three times and the reasons evolved over that period. Uh, I was the opposite of the general. I specifically wanted to be a pilot, but uh, when I applied uh, when I was in high school, I had been an air cadet and uh, wanted to go to RMC, but uh, my eyes didn't meet the vision acuity requirements at the time. So I uh, had to do something else. Um, I, I ended up joining the reserves uh, to teach with the Air Cadet program uh, because I could do that. Uh, but it wasn't until I was finishing my master's uh, in 2009 that I, I was able to reapply because rules changed, you could get laser vision correction, so I had that done. Um, and uh, as a reservist, I was finishing my master's at the military college of all places. Um, and when I went into the recruiting center, they said direct entry pilot is closed, sorry. So I ended up working in finance for 10 years uh, before I said, uh, this is something I really want to do before I get too old. Uh, let's give it another try, and here we are. You made it. <laughs> well, well, that's great. Um, so John, I have, or well, actually, I guess, um, how did your family and friends react to your decision to join? This is for all of you, too. 
Yeah, that's, uh, I was the baby in the family, so when I told uh, my parents that I was going, and I was 16, so dad had to sign for me to join the military. And uh, he was a bit nervous, because no family history whatsoever, and my mom reached out then and said, don't worry, she's never going to make it in. <laughs> so he signed the paperwork. Uh, he signed the paperwork and, you know, flat, you know, fast track six months forward when I got the phone call and uh, that I was in. Uh, Mom had a bit of a, yeah, a reaction. Uh, but, you know, again, uh, being the baby, it, it, was, it, was, it was great. And uh, I, I don't know, I, I guess they just saw how happy I was. And, uh, and they just encourage me and, uh, yeah. I'd, I'd say that my parents were probably a little hesitant when I, I came with the news. We didn't have a family history, same as uh, General Bourgeon. We didn't have a family history of, of service to, to Canada, likely in the wartime we did, but nobody that had made it a career. Um, but when my dad came to my, my Cornwallis graduation, he, he saw that it was a good thing because he saw a very positive change in me over the 10 weeks that I had, had gone through. So it changed very quickly over the 10 week uh, period, but initially was frosty, but was very warm after. So. Very good. No, no panic attacks is nice. <laughs> uh, so, so much the same in terms of no family history in the military. Um, my mother was also not thrilled with the concept, but uh, has come to be quite proud of where I've ended up. Uh, in terms of uh, when this happened, I was in my mid-30s. I was working for an investment firm in Toronto, and people thought I was crazy to walk away from that and join the Air Force as a second lieutenant. Um, I think they've all come to see the light in terms of what's happened over the last four or five years. Um, and the key piece in terms of me uh, having the support to join the military was uh, my husband, Tom. Uh, he and I had met when uh, after I'd applied, but before I'd been accepted, and so we'd been able to make all the kind of career decision choices together along the way. And without that support, I wouldn't be here doing this right now. That's nice. That was helpful. Um, so this, I guess I'll ask. We've got two two pilots, helicopter and fixed wing. Do you think that there's a difference between the between the two? Be honest. Of course, um, you know, helicopters uh, have much better hands and feet. Um, real pilots fly helicopters. Um, uh, but you know, like, but but it's funny because because I, I I've never dream, like I'm not like Ed where I wanted to be a pilot. So when I first arrived to uh, to Portage and started flying, I I actually hated it because there were so many rules. You know, it's a beautiful sky in, in, in Manitoba, but we had to fly at 1,200 feet and 70 knots. And I'm like, really? Like, really? Um, but that's kind of how you, you, you got to go to training. But actually, helicopter has a lot less rules than fixed wing. So for me, that was, uh, you can land anywhere, honestly. So that was the flexibility. I guess that was my wild side that made me go helicopters. And, and, and it was good. It was good. A response, Ed? Uh, I mean, I would concur that helicopter pilots are probably better hands and feet, or at least feet pilots, than uh, the jet types. And I come at that as a tail dragger pilot first. Right? I joined the military with um, 1,500 hours of flying and probably 30 types that I've flown. So uh, going through the military training process has certainly instilled rigor, and particularly going down the jet, the jet route has, has done that. Um, but I would agree. I think. Uh, Jet pilots don't use their feet very much, and uh, tailwheel pilots, helicopter pilots have a have a, a different skill set. Sure. Cool. And so, John, this one is for you. So you're you are an, an NCM, non-commissioned member. Can you speak to kind of the the difference in that that role in the in the cab versus the officers? Um, in the aircraft world, without the ground crew, pilots are just people with cool sunglasses and a leather jacket. Um, <laughs> Uh, when it when it comes to the RCAF as a whole, the you know the differences are, are authority and accountabilities. The the officers have command. They have uh, a commission, and they have authorities and accountabilities that they uh, that they have to take care of. And the NCMs, we rely on them to be you know technical experts in their field. And whether that's being a technician or a human resources administrator or a, or a supply tech, we ask them to be an expert in their field because they're enabling the operations that, that we need them to operate. So the, there's a, a difference. It's, it's not thinkers and doers, it's, it's a team. We are absolutely a team to, 
uh, to push forward for the, the RCF, but the, the NCMs are, are key in that, that everybody that does it, whether they clothe or feed or pay or maintain the aircraft, they're all supporting the operations. It, it, it's one big team. And I think that I'm just going to add here is on, uh, on the Air Force side, the, that teamwork aspect is so important. Like, I mean, NCMs are important in the Navy and, of course, in the Army, but in the Air Force, you know, I, I would sign for an aircraft that was fixed by a technician. And I, made, I put my life in, in, in their hands every day, uh, making sure that the aircraft was ready to go. So that camaraderie and, and that faith and that teamwork, uh, pilots are nothing without the technician and the, the supporting because we wouldn't be able to go flying. And, uh, and, and that's important to recognize. And I guess you would agree too, now being on the Snowbirds team where that's... I mean, skill, professionalism, teamwork, these are the things that we're out to share with Canadians and people across the country. Uh, so I, I couldn't agree more with that, uh, that teamwork element, both uh, with pilots and with, with the, uh, the technical side. And uh, just to go back to what the chief started with, uh, I came to Ottawa from Montreal with not one but two leather jackets, a civilian and a military one. <laughs> so there is, there is something to that. Just decide which one you want on a given day. <laughs> Next. Um, and I think we will go towards uh, the training. So maybe if you guys can all describe your experience in basic, basic training, and what that was like, and was it fun? Did it break your spirit? <laughs> well, you know, it, it, it's interesting because uh, when you arrive on basic training, you, you, you don't know anything and unless you have, uh, you know, families that can tell you um, uh, it's, it's, it's scary, you know, from, uh, from going to a civilian that has no idea to this military environment um, being screamed at, which we don't anymore, by the way. So anyone that wants to join the military, it's a much better military. Uh, but at the end of the day, you always have to remember, like, they can't hurt you. And they can't take your birthday away. But it takes a while to get to that level. And, uh, you know, being yelled in your face with the spit flying all over the place. It's, it's true, okay? It, it, ha it happened. It doesn't happen anymore. But uh, at some point, you just switch off and uh, they, they, they stop because, you know, it doesn't make a difference anymore. Uh, but uh, it, was, it was interesting. So was it COVID-19 that stopped them from spitting in your face? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't do that stuff anymore. Yeah, yeah, but it was funny because I, I joined very young, uh, well, you know, 17, but in six weeks, I lost about almost 40 pounds because it was all baby fat, I'll, I'll call it baby fat. So when my mom came to see me on the first parade, she did not recognize me. I thought they you know, were starving you. Like, I, I don't know, but uh, it, was, it was certainly interesting. It was a good diet, anyone that's interested, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> John, how about you? Yeah, I was, uh, I was in Cornwallis for 10 weeks. I showed up on the, I think it was the 9th of February, and it snowed every Monday uh, for six weeks. So we avoided the obstacle course. We avoided a bunch of ruck marches because it was snowing and we, we couldn't do it. Uh, but absolutely, we, we showed up and, and I learned new vocabulary very quickly. Uh, we had a Newfoundlander that was our platoon sergeant. And on the very first day, I, I found verb, words that could be used as verbs, nouns, adjectives, and adverbs <laughs> that I'd never thought that they could be used in that manner. Uh, but they, we they, don't do that anymore. We don't do that anymore either. We're, it's, uh, uh, it's not that we're kinder and gentler. It's that we found a more efficient way to achieve the effect that we're trying to achieve through basic training. Um, but they had, a, they had a role. And the role was to, to really make everybody equal as a foundation and, and then build you up. And they did it in their way, um, whether that was standing over you on a locker when you're changing for PT and screaming at you to hurry up and just giving you timelines that, that were unachievable just because they could yell more. Um, and then you came out of it at the other end and it was like, well, that's over. And you went into the mess hall in Kingston when I went for my threes course and, and nobody was yelling and that was such a foreign thing that no one was yelling at you, you actually had time to eat. And that was half of the diet is we didn't have the time to get everything down range uh, during it because you were either sleeping or being yelled at because it, and my, my, my wife still hates the fact that I can fall asleep like that, but that's a learned skill in basic training. <laughs> 
Yeah, eat, eating quickly is definitely still a basic training core skill. Uh, so I, I went through a little more recently in 2018. Um, and I was 34 when I went through, which is not the norm, I would say, uh, or it hasn't been historically. Uh, and especially as someone who had been an air cadet and had taught drill and knew how to wear a uniform, a lot of what they were indoctrinating me into, I had some background in. Uh, and so that whole building process of, of allowing the platoon to come together as a team was, was uh, important. But from my perspective, I had to balance, I know a lot of what's going on and I have some context. How do I share that without seeming like a know-it-all? Uh, and I think that process worked out fairly well. Um, but yes, you, you do eat a lot and you are very active. Those things have not changed over time. Good. And um, do you think that process, it was 10 weeks, was that, that was sufficient to adjust to military life? So when you went to your first posting, you felt prepared for that? Or was it still quite kind of foreign? I kind of had the uh, the longer training than that because I spent five years at the au Collège Militaire, which was kind of a military university. So it was a, a much longer indoctrination uh, period where we did uh, a little bit more. And uh, but that was a training institution for five years. And then uh, you know you go back to a uh, training institution as you're going through your wings. And again, it's a school where you're a student. And, um, and then finally, you make your way to your first operational squadron as an adult, and you're no longer uh, a student. And, uh, and there's, you know, there's, uh, I would not say, like, the, the, the status of a student or a status of a qualified person is quite different. And being grown up, really, in your first operational posting, uh, for the first time, although I was almost 24 by that time, it's uh, it's it's a different world, and it was nice to be uh, considered as a, as someone qualified and uh, a grown up at that point. That's always good. John, how did you find it? It uh, so I followed up Cornwallis with just over a year of electronics training in Kingston, and and there was still it was still in the military indoctrination period. There was still uh, weekly parades, getting you out on the parade square, and and there was weekly PT. Uh, and then all of a sudden in May of 1988, when I was posted to Aldergrove out in British Columbia, uh, I show up at the unit and you're a contributing member of society. You're not a trainee anymore. You're not, you're not getting yelled at to get out of bed and there's not a parade on Friday. You, you, you have to get after it uh, fairly quickly. I, I think I was prepared for it. I had done five years, like, like Ed, I had done some time in the cadets. So I, I kind of knew what I was getting into. Um, with it and I, I was ready for it. Uh, but it was nice to be done, like I don't know if I could have dragged out the military indoctrination period as long as, as a pilot trainee does with mill call and, and then the time in the stream might have driven me, driven me crazy. But I, I was happy to get through it and I think I was prepared. Okay. My supervisors at the time may have said something different, but I thought I was prepared. <laughs> Should call them and see. And so my, my journey was fairly direct. Uh, you know, I finished basic training as a direct entry officer and uh, had a little bit of a wait. Uh, so I went back to Toronto on, on what they call on-the-job training. Um, and then from there, I went to Moose Jaw and uh, spent uh, a few years in training through the pandemic and then became an instructor and stayed in Moose Jaw. And a few years after that, uh, here I am as a snowbird. So it's been a very direct path. And uh, I arguably haven't done anything operational yet, uh, but basic felt like just kind of a step along the way. And I'd been, been warned that it's basically a bit of a game. You need to kind of understand how they are um, trying to build you and work within that process. And, you know, it's part of the journey to pilot training, but it's in some ways very distinct from, I think, the pilot training journey as a, as a technical exercise. Okay. And what was, it, what was it like doing the training um, during COVID-19? How do you think that was different from regular training? I think the biggest impact for people um, was that uh, depending on where you were in your training, it could have sped things up or slowed them down from a pilot standpoint. The whole school stopped for a month, uh, but then um, during that period, uh, some people elected to go home wherever they were from, and some people stayed in Moose Jaw. And when they started back up, they only started with the people who stayed in Moose Jaw. And so if you, if you happen to make that decision, you made quite rapid progress uh, before they brought back the rest of the students. And that was the situation I was in. Uh, so it made for uh, a, not a continuous training journey, but uh, it, it wasn't a massive delay, at least from my perspective. Okay. 
for the two of you who haven't gone through pilot training, is there anything kind of, were there any notable, notable moments in your training where you felt like, oh my God, what am I doing? Or like, was it all pretty, pretty smooth? What was your first solo like? Just any experiences that uh, stand out for you when you were learning? Well, I think my, my, my scare came when I got to Portage on the helicopter because again, uh, flying fixed wing is, is hard, but it's much easier than flying a helicopter. So, you know, every, you know, you finish moose jaw, then you, you fly a jet, you can fly a two-door, like, come on, how hard is that little thing? Uh, so, uh, you know, we all get there, and then they, they, they send you on the Jet Ranger, which is a, a, a small uh, Bell helicopter, and oh my god <laughs> like you know it's, it's very difficult like we try to hover in a field like a farmer's field and you can't do it like it's um it, it's humbling to say the least um and then it, it takes a while and and it's magic it's it's truly magic they always tell you that you get imported you start flying helicopter they're like yeah around six to seven hours of flying there's a switch and uh, the, you know it gets thrown on and then you'll be okay and you're like in the first five hours you're like oh my god i'm never gonna be and then it's magic around that you know as they said the switch gets on and then you can stay uh within that farmer's field and um and, and then of course you get solo at like the 10 you know around the 10 hours and and it's and it's scary okay because if you're not scared i think there's something wrong with you honestly uh because uh but uh, it was a lot of fun Helicopters always make me nervous because I feel like you're asking something from a system that doesn't really want to give it to you. Whereas like an airplane wants to fly and it's almost harder to get down sometimes and stuff. But yeah, so I don't fly in helicopters, so I res <laughs> mad, mad respect, but <laughs> I mean, <laughs> too many I'm, fiery crashes. <laughs> I am kind of with Aaron. Technically helicopters do frighten me somewhat. I'm glad I don't fly them. Uh, but uh, going through pilot training as someone with prior experience uh, is interesting because the military wants you to fly the airplane in a very specific way and for good reasons. And uh, I've seen this both uh, as an instructor and experienced it as a student. The best way to get through pilot training with prior experience is to say nothing about your prior experience. The worst thing you can say to an instructor, even if you're genuinely trying to understand why, is, uh, you know, I used to do it this way or here's another way of doing something. And the answer is really, I will do it the way you want. How can I do it better? Um, so, people, uh, I guess to summarize, there are people who've gone through pilot training with prior experience who are not very malleable and it doesn't go well. Um, so, bringing experience can be beneficial, um, but it can also be a hindrance. And uh, I think in my case, it's worked out well, um, particularly coming from a civilian formation team. It's nice to be able to bring that kind of context into pilot training and uh, into what I do with the Snowbirds. John, for you, what was, uh, did you have like a, a moment where early on in your, maybe your first posting or something where you're just like, oh my God, I don't know what I'm doing here and I hope nobody notices. Um, I have those moments all the time. I, yeah, I have them all the time now. Um, <laughs> you'd think I'd get it right after 37 years, but I, I'm still learning. I, I don't think there's been the, the day where I felt absolutely lost. Like I kind of, found when I got into electronics that I actually had a knack for it, that I, I was a good student when I got into to electronics. Uh, and I really enjoyed uh, my time working on it. Um, I guess that it didn't happen to me, it happened to my shift supervisor and uh, when he, he took a millivolt meter, so looking at very small um, measurements, and he put it on a 10,000 volt line um, and there was a bit of smoke and a, and a big bang. So it didn't happen to me, it happened, happened to the other guy, but it was more like, okay, that's, that's the wake up call. There's a lot of power here. And, and we had a transmitter you could walk past with a fluorescent light bulb and it would light up and there's nothing connected to it. It was just the 250 kilowatts of fun uh, <laughs> as, you, as you walk by and it would light up the tube. So, you know, it, it was maybe seeing the, the power, but not wis witnessing it myself. Okay. Uh, but being very close when someone else did. And worried that that guy's gonna blow you up eventually. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not gonna work with him anymore. Um, I guess when we will move on to more kind of operational experiences uh, following your first posting, do any of you have kind of a, like a memorable mission or a memorable operation that you were a part of? 
something that really stands out to you as uh, kind of like, this is why I do this, this is why I serve kind of thing? Well, I, you know, I, I, when I, I've always wanted to be a helicopter pilot, so I wanted to fly a, a tactical helicopter, Army. And, um, and then I was chosen to go Sea Kings. And it was just as the, the, the replacement for the Sea King uh, helicopter was announced and, and canceled. So I showed up on the East Coast pretty depressed. Um, and I didn't want to be there at all. Okay. Uh, but I got qualified on the Sea King and, and, and went to sea for the first time. And that's really when I saw, like, I don't know if you, there's a Sea King in there, you can go have it. It's a huge machine, it's an incredible helicopter. And uh, I fell in love with, with the Navy. And of course, you know, they say that it's the, uh, being a helicopter pilot is the best job uh, um, for, for on, on, on a ship as a Navy, but it's the worst job uh, for an Air Force person because then you go to sea. But for me, it was really, really a lot of fun. And the aircraft is incredible and the jobs that we get to do every day. And uh, the first year I was at the operational squadron, I think I was gone like nine and a half months. Like my first three years were deployed pretty much uh, half the time. I visited like something like 24 countries uh, in, in, in my first operational uh, tour, which was as a you know 25 year old, that was perfect. That's what you wanted to do. You wanted to deploy and sail the seven seas and, and get the, the excitement. So uh, I think that was pretty cool. Very cool. And uh, <clears throat> what was that like for you? Because I mean, you were coming in kind of like very early on in women qualifying to or being being allowed to be um, helicopter pilots even in addition to, to just the pilots in general it was only about what 10, 10 years or so since women were able to to join that way how did you find that traveling to all these other countries where there were so many where they still didn't have women as operational pilots even in transport aircraft what was the reception like yeah and actually they had, they had open uh for pilots women but the navy was still close so i arrived as a seeking pilot on the east coast almost in the first year that they were opening the ships uh for women so they were the 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 some ships only a few ships were were uh gender where women could sail most of the fleet was still only for men it was only a few and uh, let's say that I mean the Air Force I think was a bit ahead of its year on the gender integration the Navy was a little bit um, um, uh, it took a little bit longer, so it was uh, certainly interesting. Uh, a lot of the ships were fitted for, but not with, where you could not sail. Um, and, and, you know, the navies of the world, we were, uh, Canada was, uh, was uh, ahead of many, many others. So I remember, like, multiple times having to land a helicopter because, yeah, I have a small bladder. I'm saying it publicly. Um, I had to go to the washroom, get out of the seat, go there. I would hand, I would go in the hangar, oh, remove my helmet, and then they would be like, oh, it's a girl. And then it'd be like, yes, but she needs a washroom. So uh, then I would follow them. And I, I always remember a, a Japanese ship. So I'm following this, um, this Japanese officer that's taking me, I thought was taking me to the heads or the washroom on a ship. And I was like, oh my God, they're far. And we're walking and walking. And then we're on the bridge of the ship. And he's showing me to the CEO of the ship, like, it's a girl. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, my crew is in the back. I need to go back. Anyway, that was, uh, uh, it, it, was it was interesting, to say the least. Some very, um, some, uh, some challenging time, but some good time. Uh, so, uh, yeah. And you did get to the bathroom eventually, I assume. Well, they, they, they did stop at the heads because it would have been a really long three uh, hours, yes. That's, that's yes. Good. I mean, you know, the seeking has a tube that uh, most guys can use, but it doesn't work very well when uh, you don't have the right equipment. <laughs> so um, it was just one of those things that I had to uh, go when we would get fuel. I would try to find a washroom. Yes. Yes. Many, of the, many of the aircraft were not very uh, female-friendly in that respect. No. no, not at all. 
And did you have a, a particular story like that that you, well, I'm sure it wouldn't be like that, but <laughs> I mean, maybe, I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I would say if there was an operation, um, you know, if was, someone was to look at my, my bio, they'd say, oh, you know, two and a half months as the RIMPAC chief in Hawaii would be the most memorable. And it's, it was cool, but it, you know, it's two and a half months in Hawaii. It was, it was okay. Um, two tours of alert. One was September to March. The other was March to September. So really a shift of days, a shift of nights uh, up there. Show up when the sun goes down and then leave when it comes up and then do an opposite a year later. Uh, but I, I think the operation that really sticks out was Palladium Roto 4. Um, the air campaign in Kosovo started on the 24th of March of 1999, and that was the day I was scheduled to fly from Trenton uh, into VK, into Zagreb, and then go down to Sarajevo uh, as part of the multinational signals group. And we actually got pushed off till I think about the 29th, uh, just because things were pretty busy in the airspace at the time, and they didn't want us going in. Uh, and it was pretty cool to be, it was the first time I'd worked in a coalition environment. It was a NATO mission. Uh, Canada was running the multinational signals group, so we had uh, uh, Brits and uh, the Americans were at uh, some of the outstations. We had Turks and Americans and Italians working in Sarajevo with us, so it was really cool to see the differences in the way we trained our technicians, where we were kind of jacks of all, masters of none, and then you got in and you dealt with nations where his only job or, or their only job was to, to change the modem. And they could only diagnose the modem. They couldn't diagnose any of the equipment hooked to it, where we could do the whole system uh, from from front to front to back, top to bottom. So it was, it was neat to gather that experience. I uh, got to travel around by helicopter. Um, I, I'm 50-50 on which is more fun. Um, <laughs> uh, got to travel to, to some sites uh, around um, Bosnia when we were there. But you know we were, were staying out of Serb territory, obviously, because uh, NATO was not uh, the favorite in their uh, parts of the country, like the drive from Sarajevo to VK would normally be about three, three and a half hours. Uh, but because it was through Serb territory, when we did the drive, it was like 12 and a half and we had to go down through Croatia and then come up from the south to go in. Uh, but that was probably the most rewarding. Uh, there was a, a G, G7, G8, so it was a Balkan stability summit um, where the president, the prime minister and, and uh, the UK prime minister and um, others were in, and we were the, the comms backbone uh, for that conference. So that was that was pretty cool to to be doing that for some uh, uh, high priced talent uh, when they came in, and then to see because we worked in Sarajevo, and if if you know the history of the land, it's surrounded by mountains, and it got got bombarded. Uh, it was odd. The only building that was standing with no damage was the Yellow Holiday Inn, um, and apparently they'd paid off all the sides because that's where the journalists stayed in the city, so nobody uh, took it out on that. But we would drive up what they, what they affectionately called Sniper Alley uh, every day as we were checking sites and you could just see uh, the destruction that had, that had been, that had rained down really on the city until the Dayton Accord in 94. And it was still, nothing had been rebuilt. So that, that's the one that stuck with me with the best. And I still run into people that I served with on that mission. They're, they're no longer serving, but we still, uh, share messages on social media. And I had lunch with one uh, a couple of years ago when he was in town in Ottawa. So really good friendships out of that as well. That's really nice. And what did you find? Did you find that um, having, having the specialists for these one particular things, like was that, was that more efficient or less efficient than, than what uh, the, the Canadian text would? Uh, I think they were less efficient. We, I can remember fault finding a, a system with an American and they, they, he was in Tuzla and we were in Sarajevo and we're telling him how to switch the fiber around and, and I'm telling him this and that and this and that and then it's, it's like, okay, it's your, your A1 is, is done, you have to change that and he's, how can you tell? And you're trying to explain it to him on a, over a video teleconference and in that time the connections weren't that good but you're trying to explain to him, you know, you could see it because this and this and this and they're like, oh, I, ne I never thought they would use a bunch of a test equipment where we just changed cables around. So I, I think we were a lot more efficient when it came to it. We needed less people, obviously, uh, but it was more puzzles. Puzzles were big in my family, uh, still are, and, and it, I think maybe that's what it appealed to me is, is trying to solve the puzzle. Mm. That's so fun. So Ed, you were saying you hadn't had um, like operations or missions per se, but maybe you can speak to 
um, maybe joining the Snowbirds and what that's been like uh, this year. Sure, and, and I mean, that's going to be my first opportunity to do something operational this year with Op Inspiration, traveling the continent and, uh, you know, trying to inspire people uh, to tell the history of the Air Force in the centennial year. And, you know, my mission up until now, uh, personally, has really focused on history and the history of the organization. And I think this uh, opportunity during the centennial to, to draw on that is going to be a, a great chance to, to connect the present with the past. You know, before I joined the Reg Force, um, I flew old Harvards, like the one on display here in the museum, uh, then obviously went through pilot training on the contemporary Harvard, and now I'm flying the Tudor. So in terms of training airplanes we've used over the last 80 years, uh, it's nice to be able to speak to them all directly, and uh, you know, I'm hoping that on the road with the team, there'll be opportunities to speak to that history and to what it means in, uh, in terms of uh, those who served Canada and, uh, and how we ended up where we are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Should we move on? Um, for, just for the snowboard, do you want to talk about a little bit um, what, the, what the role of the demonstrations teams have been over, starting maybe even with the Siskins and, sure. and moving on? I mean, I, we can even go further back than the Siskins, right? You put William Barker on the screen. Air displays have been um, grabbing the attention of Canadians since 1919 uh, in terms of formation aerobatics. And, Display teams have the benefit of reach. They can go out and they can expose people to, uh, to military aviation, to, to members of the armed forces who wouldn't otherwise uh, have direct connections to them. So they can fly over and, and they can um, bring to your attention that this is an institution that exists. And then we really um, like following that up with the on the ground connections, talking to people, even in firsthand experiences of what it's like and, and what they might be able to pursue themselves. And really, just to kind of build that interest, I remind Canadians that the forces are there to serve them, that it is your Air Force. Um, those are the kind of roles that the, the Snowbirds and the predecessor teams have done. And uh, I think it's, it's a pretty critical one, especially in terms of an era where demand for pilots and for technicians is high. And we need to remind people that this is, a, is an avenue that they can pursue. And what would you say so there's a lot of, you know, a lot of critics about the still using the tutor because it is, I mean, we have, we have a couple of them there. They are artifacts at this point. Um, what do you say to that versus some of the other, the other demonstration teams which use kind of more powerful, faster aircraft? I mean, you are talking to an old airplane person, so yeah. I'm not going to critique the tutor uh, as, as an airplane to fly. It's actually a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, and it, it does the role well. It, it uh, allows, you know, we were talking in the back about how yesterday the team did its first nine plane practice. And, you know, even for me, it's still inspiring to watch that. But part of what's so appealing is that it's in front of the crowd the whole time. And um, other display teams don't have the benefit of doing that because of the airplanes they use. So the tutor brings some very useful things to the table. The uh, elements of it that are not ideal, uh, it uses a lot of fuel. It doesn't have a very fuel efficient engine. And it has a relatively um, older ejection seat. Uh, but other than that, it fulfills the role very well. And it was built in an era where airplanes, you know, didn't have a, an X thousand hour design life. Uh, and so uh, it can soldier on into the future. And, you know, one of the one of the characteristics of it is being side by side. And how do you think that um, that compares to some of the others that are front and back? I mean, it uh, it takes a little getting used to, coming from mostly tandem, kind of front and back seated airplanes. Uh, the the Sendairs figured out how to make it work in 1967. They made they made modifications to the cockpit so pilots can sit on the side they need to to fly on one side of the formation. But um, other than that kind of technical change to the airplane, it uh, and the fact that you need to sit on a particular side, it doesn't make a huge difference. Okay. The last question on this will be, uh, what is the role of Snowbird 10? Just for those who don't know, it's a nine-plane nine, nine plane formation. Yep, the... so uh, on the pilot side, there are 11 numbered Snowbirds. Uh, one is obviously the lead. Uh, one through nine, the single digits as we call them, are the display team pilots that, that put on the, uh, the performance in the air that you see. And then 10 and 11 uh, are known either as coordinators or as advanced and safety pilots. So 
Um, in the winter, we're doing a lot of the pre-coordination with the sites we're going to visit. I think some people in the room have been talking to me on that front uh, recently. Uh, and when we're on the road, then we have two, two main roles. We, we kind of arrive ahead of the team and make sure everything is in place so that when the nine plane gets there, things happen efficiently. And then during the show, uh, one of us is doing the narration and the other is a, is a safety pilot. They're on the radio watching what's going on and they can call things off or provide input if needed to let the single digits put on a safe display. Okay. So for Lise and John, um, this question is uh, kind of about like what particular experiences have you had in your career that have led you to the high ranking positions that you currently occupy? Well, I think, uh, Again, it's uh, not being afraid of uh, change. And I think that, you know, there's nothing wrong for pilots that want to stay pilots forever. I think we need a lot of those. Uh, but I always have, I have a really short attention span. So usually after three years, I'm bored. And uh, it's time to move for a new job. And the military is awesome for that. So I kind of have the chance to, uh, to change job. And uh, I love flying, but I love um, leadership and people. So for me, it was kind of a, 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 a normal or a more natural path to uh, to go and, and go that way and having different opportunities uh, through the career um, and, uh, and 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 you know again it's it's not being afraid of trying something else and every job you learn something uh, and and you you become just better uh, and and you just carry on I mean we don't decide to be high ranking uh, you just survive long enough to make it there I guess <laughs> And um, so, uh, but it's also, you know, again, that, that uh, you, you know, uh, humility, vulnerability, uh, being open to learn and, uh, and, and knowing that we don't know everything and every new job brings that new knowledge that is exciting and I get to lead people and make changes. Uh, I think that benefits uh, the, the, the new generation, which is why I'm still here. You, John? I got a cough. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I, I don't think, I think it's, it's along the same lines. It's, it's about being comfortable being uncomfortable. And it, it's uh, the willingness of, of the, my family to support me to go from place to place to place to have different experiences. Uh, but there was a, a key moment as I was promoted to Master Corporal in 2001 and uh, Miles Barham who was the, uh, the chief of the unit at the time. And I think he was, uh, when we started not counting Air Command chiefs, when we went back to counting RCAF chiefs, of which I'm number six, I think he was number one when we, we flipped back to it. So Miles uh, is a great leader in his, in his own right. Uh, but he pulled me into his office before I left to go to Comox. And he gave me some advice because he saw something in me that I didn't even know that I had in me. But he challenged me uh, and he gave me some advice. And that kind of set me on a path uh, to, to where I am today, but I never aspired to be in this job. I, I'm a firm believer that uh, happiness is when your goals meet your reality, and my goal was always to be the, the SWO of a, a wing TIS unit, a telecommunications unit on a wing, and that, that, because that was my trade, it was the pinnacle in my trade to do that job, and I got to do that in 2012. Uh, 2012 to 2014, I, I did that in Cold Lake, and like, I was happy. And, and everything after that has just been, it's always been fun, but it's, it's been more fun because it's just about helping people. And, and that's the, the role of the chief is the quality of life and quality of service for people and their families. And I, I guess I excel at it because I, I've been short times in jobs and, and I got to where I am and I, I love it and I continue to love it. But I, I reflect on the, you know, what Miles told me and I, I give some of that and I go and talk to every master corporal course that we put through the RCF Academy in Borden, and now we're, we're putting them through the school in Aldershot out in uh, Nova Scotia as well. And I, I give them little tidbits out of it. I don't give them all the secret sauce. I give them just enough to make them dangerous. <laughs> and, you know, I think it, it's important to uh, look at ourselves early and declare success. And then after that, just do things because we want to. Uh, you know, it's not about, um, it's not about the destination. I think it's the journey to get there, and uh, we quite often forget um, the journey because we want to get there. Like, are we there yet? Yet, and uh, and we we forget to live in the moment. So, but that's wisdom, and 
maturity. Um. So on that for you, Ed, do you have you know, an idea past Snowbird 10 of where you want your career to go and, and the, 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 you know, kind of map out the path? I know some of it's very much outside of, of uh, one's control, but. I mean, uh, I hate to sound like I'm riffing off the last answer, but I'm very much living in the moment. And I've only been with the team for four or five months. Uh, it's quite, quite new. Uh, and uh, I have a good sense of what the summer looks like with our published schedule. But uh, beyond that, uh, someday I'd like to go back to my graduate studies, like to continue you know, down the maybe PhD road in history at some point, who knows when. But uh, in terms of immediate next steps after the snowbirds, who knows at this stage. So you want to end up at DHH, is that what you're saying? There's DHH, there's RCF history and heritage, there's lots of opportunities. Uh, but there's museum <laughs> well, opportunities as well. Coming after my job, is that what you're saying? Uh, <laughs> I'll get him at RMC or CMRT. Okay. I mean, this is the, the beauty of not knowing the future, right? There are all sorts of interesting paths and, uh, you know, uh, being open to them is important, I think. So John, you had touched on the support of your family and how integral that has been to your journeys. Can all of you speak to you a little bit about what that's been like, the impact of your family, the impact of your service on your families? I, I've been super lucky. Um, I met my husband on the East Coast. He was a, a seeking uh, navigator. Uh, so we, we got to uh, live our career uh, close by. Um, so that was awesome. Two lovely children who are both now in the military, so did a good job from a, a fourth generation pieces. They both went to RMC, got free degrees, and now uh, they're on their merry way to, uh, to whatever they, their, their heart desires. But, you know, I wouldn't be here if I did not have the support from the family. Like my husband supported, like there's no tomorrow. Uh, it's a team approach. Um, he was there when I, I mean, he allowed me to be who I am right now because again, being a mother and a spouse, it, it's always challenging. Um, so, uh, you know, I lift my hat to him because I am uh, who I am because of him and the kids have shown uh, great patience. Uh, not not easy uh, to move and everything else. And I think, you know, again, as I'm, as, as we go up, we look at, you know, time and the work-life balance, and good luck with that. I, if you find the, the recipe, please send it to me. But, uh, you know, we, we try to, to do that. But if you can't have quantity, then at least focus on the quality and how to do this. But, uh, you know, I have a great family. That's good. And did you experience, I guess, any um, kind of Know, criticism for being being a mother that it was away a lot, uh, not from your family, but just from like generally. Is it a well, it's always interesting. Like my mom and my mother-in-law. I mean, they, they still, you know, again, the older generation. But my mom would get up and serve my husband uh, the second plate at supper, and I'm like, hey, wait a second, you know, like. Um, and, and my mother-in-law is like, how can you deploy and leave the children? I'm like. But I mean, that's their father. Like, you know, he's as qualified as I am um, to, to stay with them. But you also have to be, in a way, realizing that if you're not there, you don't get a vote. Okay, so, uh, you know, like, uh, I guess like John, I, I, my, the family moved while I was away, I was deployed, and I came back to a new house, a new kitchen, and where all the stuff was in drawers that I was like, ooh, I'm twitching, twitching, and the colors, but you know, it was beautiful. And I didn't change anything for six months. Uh, <laughs> you know, and I sat on my, uh, because you know, like, if you're not there, you don't get a vote. And uh, the person that is left behind has to have the authority. And they, you know, he did great. So, uh, and I will stick with that story. <laughs> Good for you. This is public and online. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure he's listening. <laughs> it's probably for the best. Uh, John, how about you? Um, I, I'd say th three things. Like, you know, it's, it's almost 35 years now that uh, Teresa has been putting up with me. Um, and, and I must be doing something right. Uh, but there's like three points in my career that jump out that there was really an impact on the family. Uh, the first one would be... Uh, February, March of 1995. Uh, we, I did a tour of alert September to March uh, of 94. I came out in March of 94. We got posted from Aldergrove, British Columbia to Trenton. We lived in a little town called Consecon, uh, just outside Trenton. Um, 
about a half an hour away from the base and uh, on Valentine's Day of 1995, Teresa was out visiting uh, her family in BC and I called and I said, I'm going back to alert in a month. Uh, and so here was Teresa with a three-year-old and a five-year-old uh, in a province that she hadn't lived in before, but, but in a town that she knew nobody and it was not a military community. We were, like I say, half an hour from the base. This is pre-MFRC, uh, so really um, awkward space. Uh, to be in and I was getting a phone call every five days home this was pre-email pre-VTC um, you know so th there's that impact uh, the next one I would fast forward to, to 2010 so a little bit of context our young our oldest two kids uh, started school in Trenton we got posted to Comox for four years and we went back to Trenton and they graduated with kids that they started school with Emily the youngest started school in Comox and went to Trenton and then in 2010 uh, we moved her to Ottawa and pulled her out of those friend groups and had to start over and that was very difficult uh, for her uh, and so there was a real negative impact there and then the last one would be on Teresa as a professional she was in that went back to school graduated the same graduated from high school the same year as our son uh, which was quite an achievement on top of everything that else she had been doing uh, but became an educational assistant and I got posted uh, well, let's see, the job I'm in now, I've been in 28 months. So when I crossed the 25-month period, it was the longest job I'd had since 2008 without a move. So every time we moved, she had to start over. Lose seniority, uh, the last three moves prior to this one, she said, I've had enough, I'm going to retire, uh, was the salary went down a couple of dollars an hour between BC to, to Saskatchewan to Manitoba and it was it was difficult for her as on her to maintain her professional life as as my life excelled and I went up uh, and she followed my success and and the whole family uh, has succeeded in spite of my career like they've they've all done well uh, in spite of my career so that's you know and that'll be when I retire and do my DWD, that'll probably be the most emotional part of the speech. <laughs> You're doing really well. You know, it's funny that the, the flower of the military kids, it's a dandelion, okay, because they grow everywhere. And uh, that is quite the image of what we do to our family. Every time we move, you know, we only deracine, uh, what's that word in English? Uh, we remove the roots or something. Fruit uproots yeah. from one place to another and then they get to a new community new um new new school new friends and you know and they they they, they start again and they bloom and it's such a, a great flower for the representation of of military uh, children and and the spouse are incredible uh the, you know the, again when you look at the strength behind the uniform is the families because we would not be able to be who we are without their support absolutely and so uh, I already spoke to family a little bit in the opening, and uh, I've definitely seen through colleagues and friends the, the challenge of maintaining spousal employment and the, the impact that can have on quality of life and affording housing. And I've been incredibly lucky on that front. So uh, Tom works for a national consulting firm and has clients all over. Um, when we moved to Moose Jaw in 2019, uh, his firm allowed him to work remotely 100% of the time before it was cool. Um, and uh, so the pandemic didn't really change his working life in order to the move. The biggest impact I think he describes is that uh, everyone else has gotten better at using Zoom and remote tools and it's made his life easier from that perspective. But um, we've both been able to pursue our professional kind of journeys in parallel and, and I'm extremely grateful for that. Um, and I know it's not the norm for most military families. I think uh, I mean, moving from Toronto to Moose Jaw, I would say that's probably Probably a yeah. shock. <laughs> well, and, and it's continued to pay benefits because uh, I'm going to get to travel around a fair bit this summer, and uh, someone who works remotely has the benefit of tagging along for some of that too. That is so true. That is the big, the big challenge is picking where he does or doesn't want to visit in the schedule. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice to have choices. Um, all right, so we've got about 15 minutes left. Um, so looking back over your career and. Um, I think uh, Ed, you can you can uh, talk to you, speak to your experience with the reserves in this as well. 
Um, how would you describe your experience in the military and the Air Force more specifically? Like, have there been moments where you sat back and thought, like, okay, maybe I will bail? Um, or has it just been generally quite positive? I think mine has been very, very uh, incredibly positive. Like I join uh, with the idea of bailing after five years and uh, I, I just, you know, that door closed. And then it was opportunities to opportunities and then I was at like, you know, 20 years of service and then I was at, you know, and then it was the CEO of a squadron, then it was, you know, a wing commander, and then it was an opportunity, then it was a one star, then it was, and it was always a, a new a new opportunities. Uh, and I, I never quit, uh, honestly, I just forgot. So, um, you know, it's, it's not always been easy. Uh, I mean, we're going through culture evolution and the role of women and the integration like you know, we move from integration uh, to inclusion. Uh, integration was having to you know almost hide who you you were as a woman to be one of the the gang. Where now we can come to work and and be fully who we are. You know, I don't have to hide the fact that yes, I'm a woman. Yes, I'm a mother. Yes, I'm a spouse, and that's okay. Uh, it's all. It's not always been like that. So that has been uh, a relief. Uh, of not having to hide and change who you are to belong. So that has been great. And we keep on working for that. But uh, for sure, uh, it's, been, it's been a blast. John, would you say the same? Yeah, I, looking back, I don't think I could do anything else but this. I think I, I probably, I wouldn't have enjoyed it as much if I, as I've enjoyed uh, my career. If I could do it all over again, absolutely, I'd do it all over again. Um, I, I was a real uh, supporter when, when our son decided that he wanted to go in and I was just hoping that he would have the same experiences and the same adventures that, that I did. Um, but I didn't join, I, I was the same way. I, I joined as a job and it turned into a career because I just found my niche and I, I ran with it and just loved the challenge um, of getting into different situations, different technologies. and. Uh, it, you know, the future took care of itself because I was having so much fun in the day that the, the, the future took care of itself. That's a nice way to look at it, for sure. Ed, how about you? I mean, I look back on the relatively short journey and uh, things have generally gone very much the way I want them to. But if I, if I look down the time arrow kind of as I lived it, uh, there are all these decision points in your Air Force career um, where things can go the way you want or not the way you want. And at the end of phase two of pilot training or basic flight training, there's that big streaming to helicopters or multi-engine airplanes or the, the fighter stream. And uh, a lot of people come in with very specific desires and they don't always get what they want. Um, and you know, my own journey continued on to the, the fighter stream. And at the end of that, I didn't want to be a fighter pilot. I wanted to be an instructor and that could have gone either way. And then the snowboard application tryout process is very similar, that there's no guarantees in that. Um, so thinking through it as I lived it, all of those were very stressful. Despite having experience, despite being older, um, I didn't know what the future was going to be like. And um, it has all worked out very well, like I said, in hindsight. But um, that stress is real when you're going through it. And I think everyone who goes through the pilot, uh, the military pilot training journey has to square with the fact that those things can go the way you want, they may not go the way you want, but even if it's an unexpected route, I think people generally have a very fruitful career, a very good time, they experience things that they may not have planned on, but they end up enjoying in the end. And I think that Ed has a secret here, is that you know when a door closes, another one opens. And you can look at life as, oh my God, I didn't get what I wanted, or what did I get, and how do I make this a great opportunity? And I think that's, that's how successful people are successful, by staying positive and giving it a shot, and that not closing opportunities because you didn't get what you wanted. You know, sometimes we don't even know what we want. We think we know what we want, but at the end, it works out great in a different way. So not closing doors and keeping open-minded is the key to success. Yeah, I agree. I think that's, you know, that can apply to everything, everything all the time. Um, so I'd like to move a little bit toward um, what I was calling kind of the projections section of the questions. Um, so we talked a little, bit, a little bit about this in the back room, just saying the Canadian military is struggling with recruitment and retention. 
and you know, the aviation industry is in general as well. And what are your thoughts on getting more folks interested in serving with the Air Force? If I had all the answers to that, I would be very successful. Now, I think, uh, you know, again, it's uh, reconnected with Canadians. Uh, COVID did not really help us. Uh, we had a bit of a cultural uh, crisis where people didn't see the CAF as potentially a place that they wanted to be. Uh, I think that the CAF is a great place for youth and not so youth and everyone to give it a shot. Again, we used to join the military looking at, I'm going to spend 25 years. It's not about 25 years. If you want to go, give it a try uh, and, and spend five years, we'll take you for five years. And, you, you know, the same thing might happen to you where you will fall in love and at the end we'll have you for 25 years. But, you know, we never say no to people, um, you know, mothers, grandmothers, um, like, give it a try it's not about it's not a huge game okay um so i think also in a way the calf uh you know we were talking about how we we did training we are changing what the calf um we need to honestly we need to attract uh, Canadians and uh, we need to make sure they want to join us so it's a change an evolution in culture how do we train how we train how we support our members but you know more than 110 occupation so there is a job for everyone of you out there there's a job for your nephews and nieces and children and and and, and everything so uh, you know go on on our website uh, we have a lot to offer and uh, you won't regret it what are your thoughts, John? I, I think, you know, 2024 and the 100th gives us an awesome opportunity to re-engage with the Canadians and, and look back at, at names like Barker and, and those that came before us and remember them. But it's this great opportunity you know, to inspire the next generation of Canadians. If you look at the future of the RCAF, um, in the last 18 months, we've had $44 billion worth committed to capital projects that are bringing new platforms like the F-35, platforms we've never had before, like the MQ-9 Bravo, just these great new technologies that'll take us from a third and fourth generation Air Force to a fifth gen Air Force. And I think the opportunities that, that people will see themselves at maybe to come and work in this cutting edge technology, whereas you know some of the technologies we have now, they're, they're getting to the end of life. And, and this may inspire people to come join the same as when you know, we brought the, the last big modernization, I think, was late 80s, early 90s when we got F-18s and, and other aircraft in. So maybe this will have the same uh, effect on recruiting when people see, hey, I can, I can be a tech or a pilot uh, uh, of an MQ-9 Bravo or, a, or an F-35. And, you know, I, I think this is an opportunity that we can't miss out on. And we've got a team that's, that's setting us up well to to connect with Canadians and, and have some great activities to get out there and spread the message, get into schools and inspire youth and, and you know, even getting stuff on at the museum here. I know that uh, there's some tools coming that hopefully will help inspire youth and, and connecting with our cadet programs as well. And the, the cadet programs aren't about bil building the next generation of military. It's, it's about building great citizens of Canada. If we happen to inspire them to take the path in the military like I did, hey, that's great. But I think we need to, to reconnect with our cadet programs and air cadets are great. Um, one, to show them what a career in aviation could be. It could be on the civilian side, could be on the military side. Uh, but also to just get people to get into the program because it makes really great Canadians. Mm, nice. One of them is Ed. <laughs> I think the first point that was made in terms of um, people having multiple careers is very important. You know, the younger generations are probably going to have two, three, four careers in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. And being able to come into the organization later in life is one of those things I think people might take for granted, particularly in the pilot trade. Um, Canada is unusual in that you can join later in life. Most other major air forces have a cutoff date. And if you're not trained as a pilot by age 26, 29, varies by country, it's just not an option. And so we have this unique opportunity in Canada to, to encourage people to join the Air Force, specifically in a pilot context, later in life than they could elsewhere. And uh, I think that's something people should appreciate and hopefully take advantage of to, uh, to join as a, a viable second or third career if that's something they want to do. Uh, I'm amazed how often I meet people and they say, oh, I wish I could do what you do, or I wish I could be a pilot. And my typical line is that it's never too late. Um, so that would be my takeaway. What is the cutoff, just incidentally? 
What is, what is the cutoff age in, in Canada for pilot training? I think it's like uh, 40, 48, because you need to be able to get trained and get a return on investment before you turn 60, but okay. it, it's quite late. Wow. I hear some potential recruits mumbling out there. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I mean, again, remember that, you know, the Canadian Armed Forces is a place where you can join. We will train you. Uh, we will give you relatively good compensation and benefit and give you the chance to make the, uh, a world of a difference amongst Canadians and on the, uh, on, on the world, which is, you know, uh, which is a pretty cool thing to do really good at this recruiting. And I get paid on uh, quantities of recruits yeah. after, so <laughs> anyone who's interested after me, uh, just come and see me. I got business cards. <laughs> There's definitely a cut involved there, 10%. Um, all right, well, so I think maybe the last question, so we've got about five minutes left. Um, what do you think the uh, RCAF looks like 20 from 25 years from now? the impact of new technologies, John, you alluded to, to some of them, but then others like drones and AI, and how does that change the, the character of air power going forward? Well, you think uh, at the end of the day, uh, I think platforms are, are going to be completely different, but at the core of the RCAF is its people. And they're always going to be exceptional people because that's the, tr the tradition that we have and that's who joins and how we train them and the respect and the teamwork. So I think, again, uh, the people are going to be the best in the world and hopefully the platforms too. But I'm, I'm, I think my line of operation is about, about people and uh, they're the core of everything we do. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, we... The, the commander and I, we get out into town halls and, and we can say what the, the Air Force of 2035 looks like because we know what platforms we're going to have because we're, we've bought them in the last 18 months. So we know what the platforms are going to be like and we know what the people are going to be like because we know we're going to have a diverse, inclusive, respectful workforce uh, that's representative of Canadians, that's professional. Um, we're... we're building, we're more focused on, on leader character, uh, which is a, a huge step forward uh, for the institution, especially when it comes down to respect and inclusion. Uh, speaking now more about the importance of character, which I, I don't think, well, we obviously, we know we weren't in the right spot with respect to that for, for a period of time, but we're, we're getting better at it. And, and General Bourgogne has alluded to the fact that we're, in a, we're getting to a better place uh, there, I, I think the technology AI will enable our aviators to to make decisions quicker. Um, you know, we're seeing that with some of the projects that we have rolling out now. Uh, I, I think teaming. You know, the F-35 is probably the last aircraft we'll buy that uh, flies in a four-pack that there's four pilots flying those aircraft. I, I think you'll see that in the as we move to a sixth-generation Air Force. Uh, but we got to get good at being a fifth-gen first and we have to get back to what's important uh, with respect to uh, strong at home, secure in North America and engaged in the world. And as long as we don't lose those pillars uh, and we bring in uh, great Canadians that want to serve, uh, whether that's for five years or 35 years, I, I think we'll be in a good place. Do you need to add? I mean, I'm more of a historian than a futurist. So thinking about 25 years in the future, I think 25 years in the past and, you know, in terms of parallels, in the mid-90s, uh, we had just retired the F-5 and stood down 419 Squadron. Sounds kind of like something has just happened now. Uh, we stood down the functional groups instead of 1CAD in that kind of era. We've just stood up 3CAD as the space division. Um, we were going through culture change in the late 90s. You know, the, the Somalia Commission had reported, and we were kind of building on that, just as we're working with the Arbo Report now. And, um, uh, you know, if I think forward, I imagine in 25 years, there will be some organizational change. We might have a slightly different uniform. There's probably going to be some kind of a cultural change effort undergoing, uh, underway, and there'll be some platform change along the way. So I think to kind of end this where we started, it's going to come down to having the people, having enough of them, having the right people, um, and what they're going to be doing day to day is probably not going to be all that different from what we do now. All right, so I realized actually I did a bad moderator thing and uh, I'm missing the questions from the audience. So, sorry, <laughs> I had a lot of my own. Um, 
So on that note, maybe we'll just uh, we'll take maybe ten minutes and get some questions from the audience if there's any, uh, or I think online there's somebody moderating from that as well. Oh, you're gonna have to throw that, Jared. I think Jared's good. Um, so that that box is a microphone. Um, so if anybody has any questions, Jared will throw it at you. <laughs> it's very it's very soft. <laughs> I think there's one over there, Jared. Run, run for your life. Oh, no, he's got a microphone. Okay, no, there's somebody else traveling. Uh, I'm just curious as to uh, what all the initials after your uh, ranks, what they refer to. The yeah. CMM, CSM, and all this. Yeah, the CMM is Commander of the Meritary uh, Merit. The MSC is Meritary Service Cross, which is uh, an award. And the CD is the Canadian Decoration. So it's kind of medals. Uh, with services or experience. Yeah, and MMM is a uh, member of the Order of Military Merit, uh, just a different rank than, uh, than the generals and then the Canadian Forces Decoration. Uh, yes, so the same with me for the CD. And then A to C is, uh, stands for aide de camp. So uh, the, the general spoke about uh, work-life balance. I like to keep busy. So in addition to flying with the snowbirds and do some history on the side, I'm an aide de camp to the Lieutenant Governor of Saskatchewan. Thank you. And CD is for 12 years of service. Yes. Right, yeah. Anybody else? Some middle there. Launch the projectile. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I wasn't kidding. <laughs> Good job, Darren. Much. I don't know if it's on or not, but anyway. Thank you very much. Uh, I, before I ask my question, I want to say uh, that uh, I'm not in the service, but uh, it makes me confident and proud as a Canadian. I didn't convince you to join? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I, I'm a little old. Ah, no. I've been retired for eight years, but anyway. No, my question uh, is really, this is about 100 years of uh, RCAS history, and I'm curious to get your comments about to what extent you feel that the history of the RCAS has affected your lives. How much does it come into what you do, and how much of looking back and feeling like a part of a 100-year organization is affected. And by the way, my wife's father uh, was at Portico Prairie in 1943 and was a pilot. Anyway. Awesome. Well, sometimes I feel like I'm 100 years old. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, it's, it's, nice catch. You know, I, I think that we have to look at, um, for me, uh, it's, it's all the people that came before me and open the doors that were closed. And as a women who joined the military in 87, uh, they were great women that came before me because let, let's be honest, you know, yes, there was uh, women in World War I, they were in the Boer Wars, but you know, in, in the 70s, women were allowed to serve, but as soon as they got married or got pregnant, they, they were, they, they had to leave. You know, there was a maximum of 5,000 women and then that was it. And then, you know, the occupation slowly started uh, opening and then uh, they opened to combat uh, occupation and then we started sailing. But those, uh, those first women, it was extremely difficult what they did. And, um, and, and, and many of them did not uh, stay because it was just horrible, uh, let's, let's be honest, okay? Um, and, and I think I'm, I'm here uh, because of those courageous and dedicated women that opened the doors so that I could be here and, and my, my job, I guess, is to continue to progress as we go forward so that my daughter, who's about to graduate from military college, doesn't have to go through the same thing as, as I did. I mean, she's gonna have some challenges for sure, but then the baton will be passed to her to make a difference as we go forward. So that's the way I see it from more of a, a women and the integration and where we go from integration to inclusion, uh, which is fan fascinating for me, uh, but uh, yeah. Um, before I let the historian go, um, the you know, young exterior. Yeah, yeah. That the one thing about about being a chief is is you're you know kind of the steward of the history and and the traditions and the the one good thing about the traditions is traditions can change as we grow as an institution. But when we look back at the history, I, I think it's really important that we get out and, and speak and and keep the history alive. Uh, and so the last couple of years, I've gone to Remembrance Day in Mount Pleasant Cemetery in Toronto, 
and have gone to speak at a school ahead of time and, and talk about Barker uh, because Barker is interred at, uh, at Mount Pleasant in Toronto and his funeral was the largest and probably still holds the record for the largest funeral in the city of Toronto because not many people know that when he was done uh, in the Air Force he became the first president of the Toronto Maple Leafs. And that's the story behind why the RCAF colors, the retired colors, are actually in the Air Canada Centre in Toronto, is the link between the RCAF and the Toronto Maple Leafs. Yeah, okay, for the Habs fans, I get it. Maybe we bet on the wrong horse. Uh, you've won more than we have. But, uh, but, but getting out and telling the stories and, and making sure that that history doesn't die uh, as, we, uh, as we move on. So I think these engagements to get out and, and to continue to tell the story, to keep it alive, will hopefully inspire somebody. There'll be a spark there that they want to go out and, and do what Barker did, but in newer aircraft. Red Ed, give us the rundown. <laughs> <laughs> well, Barker, but Barker could not fly. He was just a great shot. That's true. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I, I mean, I think of Aaron's comments in the beginning about how much concrete went into building the runways for the BC ATP aerodromes. And I walk into work every day into one of those hangars that was built and you know you can't help but feel the history of what's happened since that structure was built in 1941 um, but in terms of telling the stories of uh, Canadians who've served uh, I think artifacts are really important and I think museums like this have a, a critical role to play but uh, there's also the living part of history and I think getting out there with with vintage airplanes and uh, particularly if serving members can fly them to tell those stories to link the past and the present and to to not just honor those, those that came before, but to, to use them as a good example for those of us who serve and for those who want to serve. I think it's important to use these tools we have. History isn't just a dusty book on a shelf. It can really be brought to life um, as a way to inspire people and, and make the future a better place. Uh, Ariane, do you want to do the, the Zoom question? Or, oh, we got one all lined up already, okay. Oh, hi. Um, I noticed you have a CF-100 up there in the center. The reason why I'm asking my question, I was looking at the Baggettville Air Show uh, page. They, they have a poster showing all the aircraft that are be flying there, like they got like a CF-18 Snowbird, and then they also include a GRF CF-100. Are, are they teasing us with some sort of uh, upcoming surprise? At that air show, do you know anything about that? I don't know what aircraft are flying in Baggettville, mm -hmm. um, but I can certainly get the answer to Aaron here at the museum. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm not sure. I know we've got vintage aircraft flying at a bunch of air shows, but I don't know if, if that's one of them. And I haven't seen the list for, for Baggettville, but we can certainly find out if they're just trying to increase ticket sales by showing that picture. <laughs> I know. It's, well, it's, it's got a little bit of discussion. The buzz all about it. You know, yeah. yeah. Okay. There's one over oh, here. You've got one there. All right, cool. Yes, the mic. Hard to see with the eyes. Uh, Hi. First of all, I'd, I'd like to thank you guys for your service. Uh, talking about platforms, General, uh, right on. <laughs> we won't say anything further. No, right it was on. it was an awesome aircraft. Yes. I mean, it, you know, yep. it 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 served Canada very well, yep. and uh, I uh, it was. It was a lot of fun. And the Brits are still flying. Mm -hmm. so. okay. uh, my question is, um, I uh, have the privilege of being a member of the uh, organization that adds a life member of the Canadian Harbor Aircraft Association. And I get to play with the old stuff too. Um, and do you think that the uh, ability to be agile in all the trades is going to continue in the RCAF because the budgets are tight? Oh, you know, I think it's cyclical. Uh, and budgets goes and, and, and comes. And uh, it might be a bit tough right now, but I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to change. And the Air Force is celebrating 100 years, uh, and it's going to continue to do great. So I'm not worried about budget. Um, I think, again, it's the people that make a difference, and we will lead our way to success. 
I, I think that the point I'll add is, is we know what the Air Force of 2035 looks like in the way of equipment, but we don't know what it looks like in the way of the structure of our people. And one of the things that the commander has asked us to do is a force structure review, because if, if you look at the trade structure that we operate under today, not just the Air Force, but the CAF, it's a Cold War structure based in the 80s. It's, it's the occupation. There's been some mild changes. The, the air maintenance trades have split and come together in a split. Um, but pretty soon we're going to have uh, no platforms left that we need a flight engineer on. So, so what do we do with that occupation? So that, that's what we have to figure out what we want to be when we grow up in 2035 as to what the trade structure needs to be for the platforms we're going to operate. So we will always have agile uh, professional aviators that will get the job done no matter what. It's just we have to look of, of whether, you know, 29 uh, managed air occupations are the right uh, configuration for the new Air Force or the Air Force of the future. And I would just add on to the people point that it's not just people individually, it's people operating as a team. And, and everyone brings their own strengths to that team. They, they join later in life. They may bring broad experience. And, you know, individuals as a team can accomplish way more. And that's going to be one of the ways we get through adverse periods, as we always have. It's been a few. Uh, Ariane. Hi. Um, so we have two quick things from our online audience. Uh, the first, Aaron, your husband saying, um, given that the cutoff age is 48, are you OK with him joining? <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is yes. Uh, Lise, Lise gets a cut. I, I gotta go with it. Uh, um, but actually, so Richard online is asking, have you seen a significant evolution of tools and metrics used to assess staff within the RCAF in terms of performance? Well, we just uh, change how we uh, evaluate people, uh, looking again as, as inclusive leadership. Okay, because we're, we're recognizing, uh, we used to um, look at competency and we forgot about character. And now we're kind of switching a little bit as looking at, okay, character is the base and we will teach you competency. And how do we reward inclusive leadership? Okay, um, because at the end of the day, it's not about getting the job done, it's how you get the job done and the, the team aspect of this. And uh, so we just change our evaluation. And for, for me personally, I think that's going to be a big change on the leaders of tomorrow because it's important to lead again with empathy, compassion, uh, vulnerability, humility uh, towards success. Uh, especially when you lead a team, okay? There's no I in team. So let's make sure that we don't reward individualists uh, and, and getting the job done at, at, at whatever cost, okay? That teamwork piece is important. And uh, so we're, we're switching how we evaluate to look at inclusive leaders. And we actually recognize uh, inclusive leaders and we give them the command opportunities from an officer and an NCMs. So we reward what we want to see. And by having more inclusive leaders, you know, the, the young troops or the not so young troops are going to look at their leaders and will try to emulate what they're seeing. And we're going to change what the CAF and the leadership of the CAF looks like in, in the future. And I think that's going to be a big change and a good change uh, because, again, uh, operational uh, success uh, is what we're uh, trying to achieve. And that diversity is important. Okay, to getting that uh, strength. So, um, yeah. I, I think the only thing I would, I'll, I'll, that, that's great on the people side, uh, and I can't add anything to that. I'd just say from the operational side, if we look at metrics, um, you know, our, our air maintenance branch can look at the number of qualified technicians and make product, uh, predictions on whether we're going to hit our yearly flying rate on specific fleets in the out years. Uh, for years to come so we can see where we need to uh, to adjust uh, to make sure that you know we have the right amount of technicians to hit targets or we can see where fleets are not going to meet the targets because they don't have the right amount of technicians so we can either train more or reallocate to make sure that the thing is there so it's we're doing data analytics but as we as we move forward with digitalization I think there's going to be more numbers at our fingertips. It's just the matter that we have to interpret them the right way. So we're learning to pull the right data that actually means something instead of pulling data just for the sake of pulling data. Yeah. I 
you have anything you wanted to add? Or? Um, I mean, uh, from a cap-wide standpoint, the inclusive kind of character assessments are, I think, critical um, and, and key. From a very niche pilot training perspective, um, one point I'll make is that there's some things that haven't changed a lot. And uh, if you look at the, the phases of tests that student pilots do, the clearhood test, their interim test, their formation test, um, those actually haven't changed basically since the BCATP. There's been some mild tweaking, but if you trace the syllabus going back over time, that's one area where the way you build a pilot has not changed a great deal. The platforms have changed, but the process fundamentally, structurally, is very, very similar. So. I think maybe we'll take one more question and then everyone will proceed to the lobby and, and enjoy there's, the catering. There's one up in the center there, Aaron, the gentleman's back yes. over there. Can you? Oh, I hope he doesn't have the box anymore, but. Thank you. Good evening and thank you everybody. That was a lovely presentation. Thank you for having all of us. My name is Jidofo and I work with University of Waterloo in the business development role for the co-op program. So listening to the presentation and the history Something we keep thinking about in um, the co-op is how to facilitate job development for the students and the next generation. So my question really is around work development and opportunities for the next generation to maybe work on uh, co-op terms or join, you know, full time. But I think more around just that experiential learning and building a bridge to connect the both worlds. Are you thinking in this direction and are there any ways that we can support that? Thank you. Well, again, you know, the, 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 the regular forces doesn't have to be a life commitment, okay? It can be a short-time commitment. Um, the reserve where uh, the youth can, can become, uh, you know, reservists where they, they work uh, evenings and weekends and, and, and different uh, kind of opportunities. Uh, on, the on the side of D&D, of &D, we have like summer um, and, and, you know, uh, co-op program uh, that we try to facilitate because that is a good way. I mean, again, you don't have to wear the uniform to be part of the defense team, okay? There is many public servants that work as part of the team because again, success is not only in uniform. Um, you know, contractors and, and academia, we will not survive without academia. So it's a full team. So if there's any interest, uh, there's lots of job and lots of challenges for the entire uh, pieces there. So please uh, get in touch and uh, we'll be more than happy to, uh, to um, I don't say the word use because that's kind of a pejorative, but uh, to, uh, to um, utilize. utilize, thank you, your talent. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much, everyone. I would invite you to join us all in the lobby for a little reception and thank our guests. Thank you all for coming.